presentation for you today. Uh, we are expecting to take um, no more than an hour, in fact, even less than that for you today, so that we have plenty of time for question and answers. So again, we're getting ourselves all set up on, um, on the Zoom webinar and getting ourselves recorded as well. So once again, hang tight for just another minute, if you would. Again, I'm just going to take a very brief moment to welcome you for those who might be just hopping on to Facebook Live or coming into the Zoom webinar. We are going to get started with our announcement of the 2021 Most Endangered Historic Places list in just about one minute. So we thank you for your, your prompt arrival. And we want to ensure that we get um, the, the hundreds of people who have registered onto the Zoom webinar before we begin. Uh, but we will begin in Oh, probably about 30 seconds here. I'm just going to check in with my team and make sure that we are ready to go at that time as well. Okay. Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, and I just want to make sure that we are going to check our participant count, everybody. Um, I see the number ticking up very rapidly on our attendee list, so it looks like you're all coming in. And out of uh, respect for your time today, and especially for our media partners who are joining us who need to file their stories, we want to keep this to a very tight schedule. So I would like to get started at this time. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining Landmarks Illinois as we announce our 2021 Most Endangered Historic Places in Illinois today. I'm Bonnie McDonald, and I am proud to serve as the President and CEO of Landmarks Illinois. And I definitely want to welcome you all, <coughs> excuse me, those who are on the webinar, I know I've given you um, a welcome, but we truly appreciate you joining us today on the webinar. And we also are on Facebook Live right now, so we want to say thank you to all of our guests, attendees, partners, and friends on Facebook Live for joining us on that um, platform as well. Now, just a couple of very quick housekeeping notes for everybody. Um, today's presentation is being recorded and a copy of the recording will be uploaded onto Landmarks Illinois' YouTube page um, later today. You will also see that there are auto-generated captions on your screen for those who may need the captions. Um, we hope that they are helpful to you. Um, if you'd like to disable those, you can click on the live transcript button on the lower right-hand side of your Zoom screen. Once again, lower right-hand side, look for live transcript and you can just click off of that. Um, or you can move it. You can also grab the captions and move them to another location on your screen if you would like to. Now, some quick facts about Landmarks Illinois and our most endangered list as well. You know, our organization was founded 50 years ago, and we have become the statewide voice for preservation policy and practice, and this program is one reason why. Our tagline is people saving places for people. We work with local advocates, property owners, municipalities, as well as appointed and elected officials all across Illinois to preserve places that are important to them and also to our communities. This is our 26th year that we've published the Most Endangered List, and it is our longest running advocacy program. Now, once we um, place something on the endangered list, the Landmarks Illinois staff and board members continue to work for years or even decades in some cases with all interested parties to see these places come to success. And since 1995, the Most Endangered program has brought attention to more than 250 historic and culturally significant sites. And we've helped to keep more than 125 of those places from being demolished. We want to thank our members, our foundation partners, um, our corporate sponsors, as well as our individual donors for your support in making all of this success possible, um, and also that we can be there for our local advocates. And we also thank our media partners for their coverage, which is key to bringing much needed attention to these places on the most endangered list. Now, all of the information that you hear today will be uploaded to our website later this afternoon at www.landmarks.org. Again, that's landmarks with an S.org. 
And I'm only going to scratch the surface today on these endangered places. So I very much encourage you to discover more details and see more photos about them on our website after the announcement today. Now, members of the media will also find a digital press packet that can be downloaded from our website shortly after the webinar ends. And additional sources for you um, for the most endangered sites can be found in that packet. And after I go through each of the sites on the list, we are going to have a Q&A portion where I'm going to be joined by Director of Advocacy, Lisa D. Chiera, and the Director of our Springfield office, Frank Butterfield, to respond to your questions. All members of the audience, including the press, are encouraged to ask questions during this period, and I'll provide more detailed instructions once we get to that segment about how you can participate. So why do historic places matter? And why do we go to such lengths to save them? You're about to find out as I share with you the 2021 Most Endangered Historic Places in Illinois. So let's get started. We're gonna begin with Altgelt Gardens, which is a nationally recognized supportive housing complex on the south side of Chicago in Cook County. And this listing um, includes three different structures within Altgelt Gardens, the shop building, school building C, and school building E. Now, first I'm gonna focus on the shop building or what local residents like to call up top. Uh, this crescent-shaped building was constructed in 1945 by the noted modernist architecture firm Keck & Keck. Uh, this is a privately owned structure that's in the center of this Chicago Housing Authority owned housing complex. But it originally housed essential shops and services that the Altgelt residents relied on, but today it sits mostly vacant. The building is in need of substantial rehabilitation and unfortunately it's currently in demolition court. The shop building is also home to a very important feature called the Memorial Wall, which was created in the early 1970s and displays the name of Altgelt residents who died from either violence or pollution related illnesses. And any rehabilitation of the shop building needs to re retain this important feature and a tribute to our loved ones lives lost. Altgelt is also home to many school buildings and we are calling attention to two of those, school buildings C and E. Both of those were designed by an architect named John C. Christensen, who was a longtime lead architect of the Chicago Board of Education. And both of those are owned by the uh, Chica Chicago Public Schools, but unfortunately CPS um, has not presented any plans for the future of these buildings. Now school C, was built in 1944 as the original high school. And it has unfortunately been vacant for more than 30 years at this point, and it is boarded up and extremely deteriorated. Carver School or School E was built in 1950, and it is also vacant but in stable condition, having closed just five years ago after housing a charter school. Now, like the shop building, both schools are prominent structures in Altgeld and are visual reminders of the lack of resources that have been invested in their care and their reuse. While Chicago Housing Authority continues to make long overdue improvements throughout the Altgeld community, the shop building and school building C and E are reminders of decades of disinvestment and deterioration at the housing complex that in the past has led to demolitions. A National Register Historic District for Altgeld Gardens is now underway. This designation would enable private developers to utilize federal and state historic tax credits for the reuse of any of these buildings. The community would like to see both schools rehabilitated for jobs and vocational training for residents. And at the shop building, or again, the up top, residents would like to see a much needed grocery store. Now here is what Cheryl Johnson, the Executive Director of People for Community Recovery had to say specifically about Uptop. This area is a gem of the community. It is a staple of the community. It is part of the history of this community. It is important to the community to have this commercial strip because it gives residents the opportunity to open businesses. Now we are asking you to help us spread the word about the vacant commercial and school properties at Altgelt. They are excellent candidates for a community-driven reuse, and potential developers should reach out to Alderman Anthony Beal regarding interest in investment opportunities at each of these buildings. 
You can also contact Bernadette Williams, the president of the Altgelt Gardens Local Advisory Com Council, and as mentioned, Cheryl Johnson, the executive director of People for Community Recovery, which is an organization with decades of experience working with Altgelt residents um, and members um, in the community to achieve environmental justice. Disinvestment and neglect, which can do too often lead to demolition, is a common theme that you will see throughout our 2021 Most Endangered list. These all represent a property owner's choice not to maintain a building, which impacts an entire community. Our next site is one where the threat of demolition due to neglect looms large, and that is at the former Joliet Steel Mill main office building in Joliet. Now, this building was constructed between 1886 and 1891 on the Joliet Steel Mill site, which produced steel from 1869 to 1983, a quite a long time in that community. And the site employed thousands of people, mainly immigrants, during the 19th and 20th centuries. U.S. Steel Corporation, which is headquartered in Pittsburgh, does still own the Joliet Steel Mill site today, and including the main office building that you see pictured here. However, the office building has sat unmaintained for nearly 30 years and it has deteriorated significantly. And if proper repairs are not made soon, the building may become a blight to the neighborhood and the victim of what we call demolition by neglect. This deterioration is highly visible, as you can see, to not only us, but the community, because the building is prominently situated on Collins Street's commercial corridor. It is also part of the 16-acre Joliet Steelworks National Register Historic District, adding to its importance, and also enables federal and state historic tax credits, once again, as was mentioned before, as potential economic incentive for its rehabilitation. Now, area residents and local preservation advocates are demanding something be done about this building. Joliet officials have encouraged U.S. Steel to sell the main office building in a lot split from the overall 94-acre former steel mill site. U.S. Steel, however, to date has been unwilling to sell. The building is an important symbol of Joliet's industrial heritage, and it is a significant cultural and architectural landmark that should be rehabilitated and reused. Now, Greg Pierbolt, executive director of the Joliet Area Historical Museum and Oli Old Joliet Prison Site had this to say. This distinctively Joliet structure represents the best of the city's past, present and future, offering boundless development potential as a testament in stone to the importance of the region's industrial heritage. Now, we're asking your help today to urge U.S. Steel to take action to stabilize and sell this important building to an entity that's willing to invest in its rehabilitation and reuse. There's a petition that you can sign that asks the Steel Corporation to work with the City of Joliet and the community to develop a plan for the steel site's reuse. You can find more about that petition so that you can sign it on our website. Now, our next site is one that has fond memories for many people but it has also sat vacant and deteriorating, facing possible demolition if a new owner does not come forward. It is also a beloved place that continues to garner local news coverage as members of the regional Czech community and local residents rally to save it. It is the Kloss restaurant in Cicero. The restaurant was constructed in 1922 and designed by Adolf Kloss, replicating a design feature um, that features themselves of traditional Czech architecture, as you'll see in the pictures. At the time of its construction, Cicero was home to a large Czech population and Klaus restaurant became a popular and culturally important gathering place to the community. Now inside, the restaurant features custom handmade furniture, stained glass and art created by Czech artists. This included a series of murals that were painted in 1938 by Gennady Gordiev, which designed, a, excuse me, defined a theme for each of the restaurant's rooms. So again, each restaurant had a room with murals specific to that room. Now today, Gordiev's granddaughter, Irene Hogstrom, is amongst the advocates pushing for preservation of this irre irreplaceable building, which could never be created again. Now, Irene told us Adolf and Ella Klaus hired artisans from here and abroad to complete their restaurant that served as an anchor for the Czech community, attracting everyone from dignitaries to working families. Klaus's current owner is trying to sell the building. However, because the structure has not had a landmark designation 
and it's truly in need of extensive rehabilitation, demolition still continues to be a threat. Now the current owner who bought the building in 2019 applied for and received a demolition permit from the city in 2020, but that demolition permit has since expired. A new buyer who can invest in proper rehabilitation to bring the building up to current building codes and to restore its unique artistic and fanciful features is needed. There is a visible deterioration on the outside of the building, as you can see, and a full condition analysis has not been done since 2018 when the building was first put up for sale. So we're asking for the public's help in raising awareness once again about the restaurant and help marketing it to a preservation minded buyer who's willing to properly restore the building and return it to its beloved community gathering space. Many organizations stand ready and, uh, to assist this, um, in this partnership. You can also reach out to Jean Ruby to see how you can help preservation efforts at the restaurant. Jean is the president of the American Sokol organization that has worked with the Bohemian Lawyers Association to prepare potential reuse opportunities for the restaurant. Now, much like the Klaus restaurant, our next site has immense local support for its preservation, the Havana Water Tower in the central Illinois city of Havana. The 132 year old water tower is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And while it's no longer a functioning water tower, as you can see, it's a prominent landmark sitting atop Main Street in Havana in the county seat, Mason County. The tower is currently in need of extensive repairs. Its octagonal brick base needs tuck pointing to eliminate the water infiltration that if it continues, will threaten the structural integrity of the tower. The metal tank at the top also needs to be properly resealed and painted to prevent growing rust. And the retaining walls that define the landscape surrounding the tower are also in need of dire repair. Landmarks Illinois provided the city of Havana with a grant in 2020 to conduct a rehabilitation assessment and determine the cost of necessary repairs. Now that assessment concluded that it could cost the city as much as $1.2 million to restore the landmark and to return it to a functioning water tower. Finding that funding is a challenge for a small city that is home to 3,200 people. Now city officials and local advocates are passionate about this project though. They are dedicated to coming up with a creative solution to raising the money needed to create um, and ensure their most visible landmark is properly restored. Now here's what Havana Mayor Brenda Stasholt had to say about her town's important landmark. The historic Havana Water Tower is very significant to our community as we view it as our landmark for the city of Havana. Visitors want to view the tower built in 1889. We plan to do major repairs to the retaining wall and steps and hope to paint the tower. Now, if you have ideas or suggestions for city officials, please reach out to Landmarks Illinois, Springfield Office Director Frank Butterfield, or directly to Mayor Stadsholt. And our contact information again is on our website at landmarks.org. Now we are staying in central Illinois region for our next site as well, the Illinois Terminal Interurban Station in Decatur. The station has been a community asset in Decatur and Macon County since it was built nearly a century ago in 1931. It helped connect passengers to Illinois cities like Champaign, Springfield, and Danville. Now, passenger service ended in 1956, however, and many stations and tracks that were once used by the Illinois Terminal Railroad have been removed and demolished, but some of the former train stations like this one do still remain. Now, this building is currently in need of repair. In the near term, the station will need a roof replacement to prevent water infiltration. Faith Community Assembly Church has owned the former station for the last 15 years and uses the building to provide social and educational services to the community. The church is planning to vacate, however, and sell the property. Neighbors and the Decatur organization History of the Heartland are concerned that the church's departure will lead to de deterioration as well as the permanent loss of social services from this historic building. Brett Robertson, chairman of History of the Heartland, told us about this endangered former train station. History of the Heartland looks forward to assisting in this project. Perhaps we can encourage some joint partnerships among our consortium to assist in the awareness campaign. 
Trains have a strong history in the shaping of our city and the interurban rail service story is not widely known. The former train station is in need of a buyer who is willing to invest in its proper repairs. Now, local advocates believe the station can continue to serve the neighborhood and be a source of much needed investment in the community. And they hope to work with the city of Decatur and nonprofit partners toward a reuse solution that saves the building while also benefiting the community. You can help spread the word about this endangered former train station by contacting History of the Heartland with ideas for new users or potential buyers. And you can also participate in Decatur Historic Preservation Week, which is coming up May 16th through the 22nd, which will uh, include information on efforts to find a reuse for the historic station. And it's also being held in person and virtually, so anybody can attend. Now, if you're in the Decatur area, you can also tour the station during an open house event on Monday, May 17th from 5 to 7 p.m. as part of Decatur Historic Preservation Week. A creative developer or downtown headquarters seeking cooperation is needed for our next site, which is a prominent postmodern icon in the heart of Chicago's loop, the James R. Thompson Center. This is the fourth time since 2017 that we have included the Thompson Center on the most endangered list. Unfortunately, we need to continue to draw attention to this one of a kind curved glass 17 story building with its eye dazzling atrium because its future can future continues to be in jeopardy. The state of Illinois owns the building, which was designed by Helmut Jahn and constructed in 1985. Now, just this past Monday, the state released its official request for proposals for the sale of the Thompson Center. The state aims to sell the building by April of 2022, and it is not requiring that a buyer um, reuse or rehabilitate the ex existing structure, leaving it vulnerable to possible demolition as a redevelopment site. Now, recently, 42nd Ward Alderman Brendan Riley introduced a zoning ordinance that would enable a tower to be built on the site. Now we believe a new tower can be accommodated at the southwest corner of the site while allowing the Thompson Center to remain. And this zoning change would accommodate that. Again, retention of Thompson Center while also building new on the site. Now for the past five years, Landmarks Illinois has reiterated that we are not opposed to the state selling the building as we understand it could bring needed revenue to the state of Illinois. What we have continued to advocate for is that the terms of the sale of the site should include retaining and reusing this irreplaceable building. Demolition of a building should not be the only advertised option for a new buyer. We firmly be believe reuse of the existing structure is the right thing to do economically, logistically, environmentally, and architecturally. Demolition of the building could cost as much as $20 million and tearing the building down would also be incredibly complicated and disruptive given that it is one of the city's busiest public transit stations um, in the entire system. Now, along with Landmarks Illinois, the James R. Thompson Center Historical Society is actively advocating for the preservation of the building along with numerous other partners. The Historical Society is led by Elizabeth Blagius, A.J. Latrace, and Jonathan Solomon. They are also leading an effort to write a National Register nomination for the building, which was actually promoted by and is a project of Landmarks Illinois. Now, such a designation would allow a developer to use federal historic tax credits for the building's rehabilitation. You can check out their website and learn how you can get involved in the preservation effort. Elizabeth Blasius said this about the postmodern icon. The James R. Thompson Center represents the evolving relationship between citizenship and commerce, between democracy and capitalism, characteristic of 1980s America. It also happens to be a spectacular public space, well used by people across the city and the region as a site of protest, of direct engagement with government, and as an integrated part of the life of the city. We are also asking you to contact Governor J.B. Pritzker to urge him to sell Thompson Center with a requirement for retention and reuse of this one-of-a-kind postmodern building. Landmarks Illinois believes the real estate market can find reuse opportunities for this irreplaceable building, including one that includes the addition of a tower to maximize the site's zoning. 
Our next site is also listed for sale and is facing potential demolition if it's not reused. It is the former Scott Forsman headquarters complex in, in Glenview. Now the headquarters of the textbook publishing company was constructed in 1966 and it was done by award-winning modern corporate campus designers and firm Perkins and Will. The large complex of four linked office buildings includes a peaceful landscape of green space, plazas and gardens for its employees. The complex, however, was vacated in June of 2020 and is facing potential foreclosure. The site is currently owned by Inland Real Estate, which has struggled to make its mortgage payments. The complex is also being marketed for single family residential redevelopment, which could lead to the demolition of the existing structures. Landmarks Illinois believes the site should be reused. If not as a corporate campus, then perhaps it could be converted for use by a learning institution. Other creative reuse opportunities also exist and could be explored, such as a center for neighborhood services like child daycare, fitness and wellness centers, or a co-working space. The fate of the Forsman site is symbolic of the ongoing uncertainty over the future of mid-century modern suburban corporate campuses designed by prominent architectural firms. Most are in municipalities without the option of landmark protection, increasing the danger of demolition and redevelopment. And the pandemic has given even further incentive for companies to downsize their real estate portfolios as many companies will continue to allow employees to work from home in the future. Jerry Johnson, design principal at Perkins and Will, had this to say about the endangered site. This place is an extraordinary example of the work of my firm Perkins and Will from the mid 20th century. It represents a modernist approach to an emerging building typology, a corporate campus. Our firm incorporated its unique experience with the design of places for education to create a campus setting for an important corporate headquarters that sits within a beautiful landscape. I believe this place is important to the community because it provides variety both in its design and purpose that makes for a more vibrant and interesting place to live and work. Here is how you can help us and local advocates push for the preservation of this site. Contact Glenview officials to urge a reuse of this historic corporate campus rather than replacement. And if you're a Glenview resident, please sign this petition asking the village of Glenview to reconsider or to consider community input, excuse me, on the future of the property. And our next site is another large building that stands as a prominent structure in its city, the Broadview Hotel in East St. Louis in southwestern Illinois. This seven story structure was designed in the classical revival style by architect Arthur J. Widmer of Widmer Engineering Company. And when it opened in 1927, it was the largest and most luxurious hotel in East St. Louis. And it quickly became a prominent civic center and gathering spot for local and national organizations. And over its history, the hotel has had numerous owners and it has sat vacant for the last 16 years without regular maintenance. Today, the building is owned by the city of East St. Louis, and there is a plan to restore the former hotel and convert it into senior housing. Efficacy Consulting and Development, led by former Missouri State Representative Yafet El Amin, has assembled the reuse plan and financing necessary to save the hotel. However, the plan is dependent on the River Edge Redevelopment Zone Historic Tax Credit, or RERZ Tax Credit, which is currently set to expire at the end of this year. This vital incentive provides a tax credit to qualified historic rehabilitation projects in, the, uh, in five river communities, um, including Aurora, East St. Louis, Elgin, Peoria, and Rockford. The program has made historic and once forgotten places in Illinois attractive to developers, and it has proven to spur transformative reuse and reinvestment. If legislators do not extend this tax credit program, this project at Broadview Hotel and many others that are planned in other river, river cities throughout Illinois will not move forward. The reuse project planned at the Broadview Hotel, which is now called the new Broadview by the development team would not only bring this historic building back to life, but create a significant number of jobs and economic activity in East St. Louis. And it's also expected to spur needed investment in the city's downtown area. Now, Yafed El Amin said the tax credit and potential reuse of this historic hotel will spur investment throughout the city. And she told us 
With the extension of the RERZ historic tax credit and success of the new Broadview, we believe that more investors and developers will see the great opportunities in East St. Louis. The new Broadview is just a first step toward the city's downtown revitalization. There is an active legislation to extend the RERZ tax credit program for an additional five years. The bill number is SB0157, sponsored by Senator Linda Holmes. This bill passed out of the Illinois Senate and is currently in the Illinois House. Representative Jahan Gordon Booth is the chief House sponsor. Supporters of this legislation include East St. Louis Mayor Robert Eastern III, former Illinois Major Senate Majority Leader James Claiborne Jr., and a coalition of mayors, architects, developers, and community activists across the state, including Landmarks Illinois and AIA Illinois. Now, please help us advocate for this bill to extend the RERZ Historic Tax Credit Program by contacting your Illinois representatives and urge them to support it, please. Our final listing is a thematic one that includes multiple individual buildings throughout the state, the Green Book sites of Illinois. The Negro Motorist Green Book was published by Victor H. Green from 1936 to 1967 to provide Black people with options for safe travel at a time of Jim Crow laws, extensive racism, and subsequent discrimination, and to avoid the threat of being in a sundown town across the United States. Commonly referred to as the Green Book, it directed Black motorists and vacationers to places that they would be welcomed, like safe lodging places, restaurants, barbershops, gas stations, and more. There were a number of Illinois Green Book sites, including businesses and privately owned homes, where people would allow Black travelers to stay while on the road. Many of the Green Book sites in Illinois have unfortunately been demolished over the years, and little is known about the cultural and historic significance of the ones that remain. The lack of awareness means these places are neither protected through local landmark or national register designation, nor do the owners have access to resources available to maintain the properties. And if this trend continues, more of the Illinois Green Book sites and the stories they have to tell will be lost forever. Landmarks Illinois believes preservation of the remaining Illinois Green Book sites is an opportunity to honor the legacy of the people and communities the Green Book serves and to better understand the critical role that they played in the struggle for civil rights and equality, as well as travel culture in America. We are compiling information on the Illinois Green Book sites with the goal of completing a statewide survey. Currently though, we are in need of survey information and additional research for sites in the Chicagoland area. If you're able to help in this work, or if you have other resources, contacts, or stories pertaining to the Green Book, please contact Landmarks Illinois Springfield Director Frank Butterfield. We are also partnering on this effort with Route History in Springfield, led by Dr. Gina Latham and Dr. Stacy Stacy Grundy. Route History's important work includes telling stories of the tragedy, resilience, and excellence of Black people along Route 66 and in the city of Springfield. And we encourage you to follow Route History and support its work. Stacy Grundy, Vice President of Route History, who Landmarks Illinois named as a Landmarks Illinois influencer in 2021, had this to say about the Green Book sites. The Green Book saved many lives and was a roadmap for Black people to travel safely and ultimately have a better quality of life in the face of racism and discrimination. It is all of our responsibility to preserve and tell the untold stories of those Green Book sites so that future generations, especially Black children, understand the rich legacy that they come from. Now, we actually would like to play a video clip of Stacy so that you can hear directly from her about why the Green Book is so important and why we need to preserve the remaining Green Book sites in Illinois. Please watch this very short video and we will be right back for the Q&A portion of our program. You know, give us just a minute to queue up the video and we will show you Dr. Stacy Grundy.
Hello, my name is Stacy Grundy. I'm the Vice President of Root History Incorporated, located at 737 East Cook Street in Springfield, Illinois. And why I think it's important that we preserve the endangered green book sites is because these sites tell a story that has been left out of the history books. These are stories of entrepreneurs, of community activists, and people who just got up to work every day to help their communities. It's important that we preserve these sites and the stories along with them so that our children understand the rich legacy um, that they come from. Um, at Root History, we share these stories. We are literally people saving places for people. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Stacy. We appreciate your time to put that clip together for us and welcome back everyone. The clip that you just watched is part of a longer video that we will have available on our YouTube channel later featuring all of the local advocates from our 2021 Most Endangered Sites. These local advocates are the people who are active in the preservation efforts of our most endangered sites. They are literally the people saving places for people. Now, most of them live in communities where these historic places are located and they are the ones working to rally local support to save them. For months, we have been working in partnership with them to make these places part of this year's most endangered list. For months, Landmarks Illinois has worked in partnership with them and we want to thank them for taking time to tape themselves and tell us why these sites are important to them and their communities. Now I encourage you to check out our YouTube page or stay tuned on social media to watch this full video. You can also find contact information for these community advocates on our website as part of our digital press packet. Now we're gonna open up our Q&A portion of today's announcement. All members of the audience, every one of you, including those of you on Facebook Live, as well as here with Zoom, um, are welcome to participate, welcome to ask us a question. We're happy to engage with you and we, we're sure you have a lot of questions about them. Um, so Landmarks mem members, members of the press, you know, please, what we're gonna ask you to do is use the Q&A feature. Um, before you do, I'm gonna welcome two of my fellow colleagues to join me on screen, and that includes Lisa D. Kiera, our Director of Advocacy, and also Frank Butterfield, the Director of our Springfield office, and they're gonna be joining me to answer questions. Uh, those of you on Zoom can type your questions into the Q&A feature. You'll find that at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. You just go in there, type your question, and we will uh, monitor that and raise them so that everybody can hear them. Um, Lisa is going to be reading off your questions, and I swear we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, you can also see that the chat feature has gone away for the moment, so please submit your questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom. Um, those of you joining us from Facebook Live, you can also participate by submitting questions in the comment section of the video live feed, and we will have staff notify us of your questions. And if we do not get to all of them, once again, you can find our contact information and that of the community advocates on our website, www.landmarks.org, and you can reach out to all of us for more information. So let us go to the Q&A portion and get started. So Lisa, do we have any questions that need to be answered? Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I have a question that's come in from Bob Joint and he is asking roughly how many Green Book sites are left? And so Frank, I think we'll turn that question over to you. Thanks, uh, Bob. Uh, that's a great question. And, and one of the big reasons we, we wanted to highlight uh, green book sites is just how much research uh, needs to be done. There has been significant research uh, from the National Park Service along Route 66 uh, to see which of those sites still remain. But from a statewide perspective, uh, we, we don't have great uh, details on how many um, are still standing. From our early research, we can see over 250 individual places uh, mentioned in the Green Book pertaining to Illinois. Um, one of the goals will be to find out um, uh, how many of those remain, but then really also to elevate the, the stories of the people um, that traveled there or operated those, those businesses. So um, keep an eye on landmarks.org and through our partners at, at Root History on ways we can uh, flesh out that information uh, related to Green Book sites in Illinois. So we also have Lila Wills, who's a, a friend of the organization, asking a follow-up question about the Green Book sites. 
And Lila is someone who's been doing extensive research on the history of the Black Panther Party in Chicago and throughout Illinois, and is really interested in just, can we be more specific about how someone like Lila could even help with the Green Book sites? What is actually needed for someone like her who is a great researcher and, and really interested in this type of uh, history throughout the state? Uh, there's 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 going to be a lot of different aspects that that are are needed, uh, and thank you for any uh, offers of, of willingness to to volunteer essentially uh, to support this this work. Um, as as we we gather information a, a, across Illinois, all the way from you know, Rockford down to Centralia and Carbondale, um, we we will need to know you know what uh, whether those places are are still standing or not. But also beyond that, whether or not they they are standing, we would love to compile. That research of, of what happened there, what are the what are the stories from there, who who um, can still uh, who remembers? We, we have we have people that, that traveled through some of these sites. That it'd be great to um, work with a partner like Root History on uh, the oral histories there. So really, the goal here is um, we don't want to see another one of these buildings lost without you know, at least a full recognition of of the stories they can tell about. Um, uh, the uh, struggle for equal rights we, we mentioned, as well as um, a tourist culture um, in the mid 20th century. And so there's also partnerships to be made with uh, city officials um, and uh, even like even the state, uh, potentially legislators, on ways we can help uh, support uh, the, the places that remain and help to share the stories that can be told. Lisa and Frank, can I give a follow up there as well? So, you know, to Leila, thank you so much for that question, for all the work that you're doing um, to ensure that we understand the history of the Black Panther Party, because so many of the sites that we knew of are gone, uh, at least physically, and we still need to tell their stories of what was there and, and also the, the history, the memory that still remains. I was gonna say that some of you might've heard of citizen scientists out there who do work for NASA, for example, what we need is citizen researchers. And that is, uh, we thankfully heard from one of our um, reporting partners that they're interested in doing a map of these sites and hopefully we can work together with that. But then one of the first steps may be to just go to Google, Google Street View. If the city is large enough to have had Google Street View done for, um, for it, and see if it's in Google Street View and when that photo was taken. And then we need people who are actually willing to take a road trip and go and make sure it's still there. That's kind of step number one. Um, but two, you, you can't necessarily see history. We need to do the research to understand, you know, who are these generous people who opened their homes up to, to travelers to keep them safe? You know, who were the business owners who stepped forward to make safe places? Um, what were their names? You know, what was their history? And, and are people, did people succeed them in that? Uh, that's part of crafting the whole story. So I think we really need citizen researchers who are willing to help us with that as well. It's definitely Frank, you... going to be a crowdsourcing yes. oral history effort to continue to uh, gather the information we need and on one the quick Green Book sites. And, and sorry, Frank, I was just going to say, Caitlin, our communications manager just wanted me to remind everyone that there will be more extensive information on our website that you can go to to learn about the Green book sites and what we've gathered to this point. Um, because we just like to get, uh, move on to a couple other sites that people have questions about. Um, Ann Owens wrote, on behalf of the Decatur community, I want to thank Landmarks Illinois for being advocates for the stories of our structures and our people. Do you have any other members that maintain an interurban terminal? I think she's looking for a model. Uh, it would be great to find out uh, uh, if, if any other people have in their communities uh, uh, an interurban terminal or station along that route. Uh, thus far, uh, we found out several that have been demolished, uh, and the, um, uh, we do know that the interurban uh, company, their headquarters in Champaign is on the National Register. That's the, the business headquarters. Uh, but um, we, have, we have other examples of uh, historic depot and station uh, reuse, um, whether um, as actually continuing to be a station or things like a coffee shop or other, uh, other services uh, that can operate out of those historic buildings. So it'd be great to, to learn more about if anyone else has that specific interurban station you're going from 
Danville to, to Springfield and uh, up and down what's now sort of I-55 corridor. Um, but also we have, we have plenty of examples we can share with, with uh, people about uh, historic depot and station reuse. And Leighton Olson is asking, how might the transportation related sites participate in mobility infrastructure federal funding proposals, including rails to trails, transportation amenities, TOD and other programs. Of course, we know that there's a, a very large um, infrastructure bill right now coming to Congress. Um, so I think it's interesting, Leighton is asking, where can we look for federal programs that may be able to help some of these sites that have that type of transportation or infrastructure tied to them? Um, he's also noting to that point that Thompson Center um, obviously has the CTA station in the building as well. And uh, Decatur and East St. Louis are, are very large heritage hubs. Uh, I'll, I'll add in uh, there, Lisa, that, um, the, that we are talking as a country right now about infrastructure. And it's a, it's a wonderful position to be in when we talk about our existing infrastructure in Illinois, whether uh, an old depot or we talk about Havana's water tower. I mean, that water tower was part of, part of the, the infrastructure of, of that community. The, the number one recommendation I can make, and Landmarks Illinois is happy to partner with you on this, is to get to know your legislators, whether at the state level or the federal level. And we, we work uh, hard to maintain uh, those relationships. We participate in a, a federal uh, advocacy week every week, uh, every year, excuse me, where we um, visit the, the, the members of Congress for Illinois. And uh, it, is, it is remarkable to hear how much they say, you know, when they get uh, more than a handful of emails or calls about an issue or a place, they take notice. So just really want to emphasize that your voice is and can be heard by those people. And when they are in those negotiating rooms talking about infrastructure and what gets in and what gets out, you want um, those sites kind of in, in the, the, the front of, of their mind. Again, we, we at Landmarks will work hard to build those relationships and we're happy to partner with you on uh, a conversation or a strategy to uh, make those connections. Thanks, Frank. Um, no surprise, we have quite a few questions and comments coming in about Thompson Center. Alex Bean has asked, has there been any signs of hope regarding potential purchasers and their plans when it comes to the sale of the Thompson Center? And I'll just say, Alex, that it's extremely fresh, literally just yesterday, um, the state of Illinois released its RFP for its request for proposals for the building. So um, we are aware of some developers that are interested in the site and uh, developers who do have an excellent track record of rehabilitating and reusing historic buildings, especially with historic tax credits. Those are the developers we're hoping will come forward. Um, at the same time, um, Rhoda Pierce has asked if it happens, where would the proposed tower be built on the Thompson Center site? And what would be the potential use? So the fear that we have is that the developers who most likely will be attracted to the site are those who would be interested in demolishing the Thompson Center and building a new super tower on the site since it can be accommodated. In 2018, Landmarks Illinois released a series of renderings in collaboration with Helmut Jan that demonstrated his vision of how a new tower could still be accommodated on the site connecting to the Thompson Center to demonstrate that you can have a win-win situation. You can have a new tower built on the property while retaining and connecting to the Thompson Center. And so we know that there are um, two opportunities there. One that can be just a purchase, rehabilitation, reuse of Thompson Center alone, and one that still retains Thompson Center and allows for a tower to still be built on the site as well. And um, we're really excited to talk to developers about both of those opportunities. And we have also on our website information with links to the state's new uh, request for proposals. Um, one thing we do want to note is that the building is indeed already determined eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, which is not noted in the request for proposals by the state, which 
It was unfortunate to us uh, because again, that National Register eligibility is extremely important in terms of potential financial incentives for a developer to reuse the building and in terms of proper regulatory review of proposals for the building. And uh, we at Landmarks Illinois, also with assistance, grant assistance from the National Trust for Historic Preservation, were able to uh, retain Preservation Futures to prepare a National Register nomination for the building, which is actually underway and currently under review by the State Historic Preservation Office. So we will continue to advocate for the building based on its not only its architectural significance, but as Bonnie said earlier in the presentation, it's feasibility to be reused. And uh, we all know it's the right thing to do from a sustainability standpoint and from a transportation standpoint, and this building could never be built again. Bonnie, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks for the question, several of you, and, and specifically to Rhoda. The, um, I wanted to say, you know, our script recognized that the Thompson Center is eligible for the Federal Historic Tax Credit and also our relatively new Illinois Historic Preservation ta Historic Tax Credit, which is our statewide tax credit as well. So there are multiple incentives that could be, um, that could be apl applied to find a sustainable reuse for this. But furthermore, I just wanna say, Lisa importantly notes the determination of, of eligibility. And since I know many of you on this call are very interested in the Thompson Center, that that does provide for regulatory review for this site and that there's an opportunity for public comment. So please keep an eye out as um, any review comes forward. We will be publicizing this on our social media because uh, we want your voice to be included in this process about the future of Thompson Center as well. So Ted Karamansky, professor of public history at Loyola University, a great partner to us. And uh, of course, as you heard earlier, our intern Miranda was is from the public history program at Loyola. Ted is asking, is US Steel willing to grant public access as well as to donate funds to the administration building? And as we understand it, there has been some recent communication, very recent, uh, literally within the last week, between US Steel and Joliet officials, again, about some emergency repairs that absolutely need to happen at the building in order to make sure it still has a viable opportunity to be rehabilitated and reused in the future. So U.S. Steel is apparently uh, listening to Joliet officials in terms of uh, what they would like to see in of immediate repairs. The roof, we know, is, is one of the most pressing issues at the building. Um, have not heard yet if they're willing to grant public access, but we will continue to push for that, as I'm sure uh, the city will as well. As, and then again, the conversation that really the building needs to be uh, siphoned off from the rest of the property and sold separately so that it has the opportunity to be reused. So thank you for that, Ted. Lisa, may I also just publicly state that there are, there are other alternatives that we can work with um, U.S. Steel as well as the city. For example, there can also be long-term leases that are done where property owners are not eager to actually sell the land below a building, but they'll do a long-term lease which will actually make it available for the use of the tax credits we've mentioned so much in this presentation. So there are other uh, opportunities and that's where Landmarks Illinois hopes to be an asset in this conversation um, with the wonderful board of directors we have and their pro bono knowledge and services that they provide about development proposals that can move forward. So just some additional dialogue regarding again, the Decatur uh, station and interest in the history of interurban uh, travel. So I like that everyone is able to just sort of see each other's questions and answers and, um, and, and create a dialogue on that history. Um, Bob Joint has said, I'm shocked to learn the owner of the class restaurant applied for a demo permit. Can this building be landmarked to protect it? So Bob, that is one of the challenges of uh, trying to find um, a solution for Kloss and really just heading off uh, any potential demolition. The city of Cicero does not have a historic preservation ordinance at the local level. So there is no way for the Kloss restaurant to actually be 
designated a protected local landmark to prevent its demolition. Uh, the, so that is really why we're left to continue to work with these wonderful organizations that have really been trying to spread the word about the importance of the building. Um, as Bonnie stated, the Bohemian Lawyers Association of Chicago, um, the American Sokol Organization, uh, these groups are really focused on trying to find some partners who could work with them. And uh, the National Register, even if we were able to get the building listed in the National Register of Historic Places or determined eligible, that does not protect it. National Register listing is an honorific uh, designation. So that is why getting that building in the right hands is so important. And as Bonnie stated, it's currently for sale. Please uh, reach out to us. We, you can, we can connect you to those that are interested. Um, there's many people that think it would be a wonderful concert venue as well, um, and a place that could just continue to really help drive um, the local economy in Cicero as well. Lisa, looking at our time, I think we might have time for one more question or comment, and then we should close the program. Sure. So I received a comment earlier, speaking of class, from Joseph Bar Topinka, um, who is the son of, of the late Judy Bar Topinka, who was, of course, a great advocate for historic preservation in the state of Illinois. And uh, he is very thankful to Landmarks Illinois for bringing attention to the Klaus restaurant, which has um, such great memories to so many people and it holds such an important legacy to um, not only the Czech community, but um, so many longtime residents of the city of Cicero. So again, we look forward to um, connecting a lot of people who are interested in the future of this building to, uh, to all the folks that are really trying hard to bring attention to it. Frank, so that's it, Bonnie, thank you. Yes, yeah. I think Frank had a comment, it looks like. If I could just make a closing remark, um, just that I, we appreciate all the, the, the support uh, from, from our, our, our members, our, our advocates across the state, and uh, to, some of these will take uh, uh, some time. And, and you know, like for example, with Green Book, we, you know, we'll be looking uh, to, to certain milestones like the centennial of Route 66 in 2026 uh, in five years. How, how many Green Book stories, you know, what we can share at that point to elevate these stories. And uh, Bonnie sits on that statewide commission too. So Landmarks Illinois has a place um, uh, for, for uh, a commission like that. But also just with um, more time sensitive with the Broadview Hotel in East St. Louis, that RERZ tax credit expires at the end of the year, but we need the legislature to act by the end of the month. So May 31st is the big deadline there. So anybody who's able to reach out to their legislator to say support that bill uh, would be greatly appreciated in helping moving that project forward. And Bonnie, the only thing I wanna add, just because we always love it when mm -hmm. um, students get involved, younger people in historic preservation efforts, is a student has posted, how can students help in preserving these structures and legacies? And um, I think earlier it was stated, especially with the research that's still needed on green book sites. Um, we're always looking for students that are interested in helping with research, uh, with documentation. Sean Riley, who is an architecture student at IIT, helped us with photography for the presentation you saw today. Um, we're always happy to work with students at any level uh, of their schooling, graduate school, college, undergrad, uh, high school, please reach out to us. Thank you for the comment. Yeah, well, I appreciate the kudos you're giving Lisa and Frank, uh, because I'm just going to beg for two more minutes of your time, everyone, so that I can give some important thank yous to those who have helped. So, by the way, if we didn't get your, to your questions please you know, continue to post them on our um, social media. We will pay attention to those throughout the most endangered process. And then also you can reach out to us um, personally. You can find our email, um, email addresses on our website at landmarks.org. Um, so I just wanna take a, a moment to thank, especially you know, the two people you see on screen here and more, but uh, to Lisa and Frank, um, these two people are incredible advocates and also, 
supporters for those who are advocating at the local level. As I said, we talk about our work as people saving places for people and with people. Um, and these are the two that do the greatest deal of support to our local advocates. So I wanna commend them for all the work they put into the um, compilation of the most endangered list. And uh, truly this is a beginning. We will continue to work on these until we find a successful outcome for them, we hope. Um, I also want to give uh, significant kudos to our communications manager, Caitlin McAvoy. Many of our media partners will be working with her, as well as if you are looking at our website or looking at our social media, you are seeing the work of Caitlin McAvoy. So I want to thank her for, you know, really dozens and dozens and dozens of hours that have gone into preparing the media for this, the press packets, and all the um, presentation materials today. So thank you to her, um, to Julie Carpenter, our office manager, for an excellent job running today's Zoom, um, and to you all for participating. And just one, one um, more call out to Miranda Reidner, who is a student at Loyola in the public history program for being our intern on this project, and to Sean Riley for his work on the videos and the photography, the student at IIT. So we, we do um, very much value students who do this work um, and make sure that, you know, that we provide them with, um, with fair pay and expertise in the process. So if you know of students, please send them our way. Um, I'd like to thank our annual corporate sponsors for Landmarks Illinois who make this work possible. We are a nonprofit and uh, dependent on the generosity and donations of corporations, foundations, and individuals. So I hope that you'll become one of those um, and you'll find our calls to action as well as ways to support Landmarks Illinois on our website at uh, landmarks.org. Um, you'll also want to make sure that you're signed up for our free email newsletters to receive future updates about what's happening with the most endangered sites and also uh, the many, many programs that we have at Landmarks Illinois and the news that we cover. Um, you can find that by going to our homepage, scroll all the way down to the bottom. There's a section that says stay in touch. You insert your email address there and boom, you'll start getting free um, e-newsletters e and emails from us. And I promise we will not clog your email box. We try to, um, we try to keep it to the priorities. You know, there are many reasons why people save places and why historic places matter to us. Um, it might be something like our identity, our culture, history, um, memory and belonging. Um, we know that you're here because there's a special historic place, uh, historic place to you. There's a historic place that's special to all of us. Now imagine if that historic place that was special to you was endangered. You know, of course, we would want to support you, and I hope that you'll take action to support the historic places that we've raised today, and that you'll take this awareness and take action to help others with these places that are special, unique, and tell the story of our history in Illinois. So we urge you to take action on our 2021 Most Endangered list. And we greatly thank you for being active and engaged in this announcement today and look forward to hearing from you further. So enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much for being here and, um, and goodbye. <laughs>